Uh, very happy to say. Will is to my right. Will, hello. Hi, lads. Michael McCarthy, hello to you. Hello, Joseph. The doctor is back from secondment. He is here in studio. Arthur O'Dee, hello. Dr. Oh, O'Dee. Joe, how are you? <laughs> you were in Manhattan. One week's not secondment. Fair enough. It felt like <laughs> it, man. We missed you. Uh, you were in was, Man- yeah, Manhattan. Was. The was. Big Apple. Big Apple. Do they still push the Big Apple thing? <laughs> You've no. said it about five times. The last <laughs> it's the Big Apple. The Big Apple. Days. It's still called the Big Apple. You can see it. Yeah, their no. t-shirts saying the Big Apple. It's more I love NYC. I that's love the NYC. Thing. That was clever. Did that start in NYC? Did that start? Because like, it's everywhere now. Whatever city, there's the I love whatever city. But I feel like it was an I love NYC. We've gone off on a probably we've gone like fairly hard <laughs> off on I one. Can't there, answer yeah. that one. <laughs> okay, hundred miles an hour. You weren't even given a chance to answer. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry. I need to calm down. I'm, I'm, I'm buzzed up. I feel a few too many coffees today. I think thirty-six degrees. You were saying real feel. I think it was the actual thing. It was like thirty-three, thirty-four. But yeah, <sighs> felt every degree. Of it. Not much of a breeze through. Uh, that was brutal. Fifth Avenue, I'd say brutal. Yeah, tough going. I, yeah. I don't know why. I can't why handle would, that. Why would you go in high summer to Manhattan? Why do you keep saying Manhattan and not just New York? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> That's, I'd be just hanging around Manhattan. I okay. Why do we New York here? But it was hot. Really, really hot. Too hot. <laughs> it was enjoyable, but too hot. What did you get up to? Uh, I don't know. Like went to the Met. Uh, did you, did you or did you not go to the um, Greenwich Village and see yeah. where Bob Dylan? Oh, I didn't go. To, I didn't find. I didn't find the particular street that you were talking about. But in general, walked around there. I liked it down there. It was oh, nice. Yeah. You weren't going looking for like where Bob Dylan got his inspiration in the no. late fifties or. No, 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 no. That's disappointing. I'm surprised at you. I, like yeah, I mean, I, there's a. There's a transparency to that sort of fandom <laughs> that I don't particularly never gripped me. I tell you, your 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 fans, the fans of your PhD who downloaded it and listened to this. No seriousness, I checked before, and do you know what is that now? What? It's over four hundred. And what was it before? Like in general, before before, before we mentioned that you had a thesis on non-existent. That. Like <laughs> three, like yeah, probably yeah. Like nobody would be like that, that's a four hundred, <laughs> four, four or four hundred. That's more tickets than they've sold for the hurl about. Oh, ouch! Wow, <laughs> he wasn't ready for that. I don't mind. I literally he opened. Even I was opening a DM for someone wondering about tickets for the. I want to jump hurl pods. Go with hotcakes. Bloody hell! The board, gosh, it's a big, big venue. Very big venue. <laughs> <laughs> you fit all of Arthur's PSD fans in yet. Vicious venue. Not since the toy show has there been an effort. <laughs> <laughs> it, I think Joe, if we lose 2.2 million, I'm out. Ah, <laughs> uh, dear. As opposed to an RT where to get promoted. Exactly. Ooh, sorry. I was disappointed you didn't go and see any theatre, by the way. I had a look, but there was nothing that caught my eye, to be honest with you. Really? Yeah, it's like, I wouldn't, I, I don't go to no, yeah, it's not something I'd be even accustomed to looking out for. Wouldn't, um, even, wouldn't it cross my mind if you didn't say it, put it that way. We went to New, we went to New York, New York Manhattan. back in, I was about to say Manhattan, <laughs> uh, 2018. I was, we were there for a week, I'd say we went to four plays. Yeah. Expensive. Very but fast. you know, it's funny, like for instance, we went to see um, very much off Broadway. In Dylan's neck of the woods, on in that area, we just came across Billy Crudup in a one-man play, Harry Clark. Very small theatre. I mean, really off Broadway, and I'd say it was twenty-five dollars yeah. a ticket. And it's it's still top five things I've ever seen in person. He played every character in the play, and I'd say within five minutes you kind of somehow had forgotten this. He was mm. just that extraordinary, and so you don't really get that kind of caliber in every city. In the no, world, no, so. for sure, for sure. That's why I thought you'd be all over that. Does, yeah. It's okay. Does it speak to our differences as people that I was disappointed he didn't go to the baseball and you were disappointed he didn't go to a play? It does a bitch, yeah. Yeah, I think yeah. so too. Yeah. I'm the better for it though. What did you do then? A lot of wandering around. Went to a few galleries. I was quite interested in. It was quite nice to see a lot of those kind of things and yeah. paintings and stuff in the first hand. That was pretty cool. All inspiring. Um, do you find a gallery after the first half hour it's just hard I'll tell you what this is that, it it's absurd how big say the Met is yeah absurd so then initially I feel you walk in you're like wow I'm going to really pause on oh, this painting but give it an hour and you're just walking there's stuff you're walking priceless past. art because yeah. you're just it's like crazy. Hey, when does this end it's like that's 3,000 years old well it's not what I'm <laughs> here for 5,000 years old over there <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> on we go they'll fabric eggs no 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 <laughs> just yeah. carrying on yeah that's I suppose the nature of it but you just kind of look for what you want yeah okay good it was, cool, it was enjoyable overall. Yeah, okay, no, sorry. I, like we're going to, I think we're going to New uh, Iceland, sorry, in oct- later in the year, October, I think. Oh, yeah. October, November. I can't wait for that. 
it's not going to be hot there. Are you going for the Northern Lights? Uh, no, like, I don't know, not particularly. Just going for a sec, going. Never been her, it's class. So why not? Yeah. I mean, anything, anyone else going on any holidays you want to talk about? It? Like, yeah. Yeah. Oh, the centre <laughs> park. I'm carrying it here a little bit. Uh, very quickly become a hairdresser segment. Actually yeah. going to a beach in Mallorca, it's not going to be that interesting. Okay. Um, we'll push on. Welcome back. Thanks. Yeah. We it was you. a long, long absence. Thanks to Colin for sitting in. Keenly felt. Did you watch last That's week's unfair. Tangent to no, Bank? No, no, no. no? Wouldn't have any interest if he's not in it. There's, there's no need, you know. What are we giving Bowie? Give a ten. I know I said two joking last week, but ah, no. probably more like a five or six, a, eight, eight or Ooh. nine. I'd say. Yeah, it's hardly the keep, is it? <laughs> <It's> <laughs> like, <laughs> my ratings were close enough to the keep. Uh, well, I get to some emails. Uh, Let's do it. A slight tangent at ball dot com. Dear sirs, congrats on a free flowing random conversation being the best radio show of the week. Slightly concerning in itself, but I digress. <laughs> GAA commentators using childhood nicknames when covering adult intercounty games Bubbles, Brick, Soupy, etc. It's trying to accentuate the world renowned, down to earth realness of GAA players of both codes, ordinary people of the soil, etc. It doesn't happen in any other sports coverage. It's shite, and they should tighten it up. <laughs> <laughs> Regards, Emmett Keane, he puts in brackets, Emmett, I know, I think, listens to the golf podcast. Joe will know how to pronounce it. So even though his name is Emmett Keane, as in Robbie and Roy, he thinks it's pronounced Kane. So I suppose we'll indulge him, but it's a complete fantasy. That's a Western thing. <laughs> yeah, he's from the West. Emmett yeah. Keane, Kane. He knows Nathan, actually. He's out that neck of the woods. Right, okay. Uh, so... This was the first year I realised Soupy was your man's. Oh, name. but it's like I, I've heard him refer to Soupy Campbell for years, but never by a commentator until this. The, the, the person you would least expect it was Jer Canning calling him Soupy Campbell <laughs> throughout the Ulster Championship. But, but everyone just start, started doing it overnight. It was as if like there was an email going, his name's actually Jermaine Genus, and from tomorrow on, yeah, you call yeah, him Genus. Yeah, yeah. It was just like Soupy. Yeah, good nickname for a man called Campbell. Like, but does anybody think? Uh, <laughs> yeah, <it> is, yeah. <laughs> anybody have a problem with bubbles and soupy and uh, brick? No. What the? Why? You, why does your man say their childhood nicknames? Like, I mean, they're still called that. So, what difference does it make? I actually think it's nice. So do I. Yeah, I don't. I don't have a. I think there's something. There's nothing. It, it's not about this kind of like sense of amateurism and men of the soil or whatever that he's trying to say there. It's about a, a colloquialism that there's nothing. There's nothing wrong with. I would say that we are a little bit closer to these guys, and you're as likely to know someone on the pitch if you go to see your county play as you are not Yeah. Um, if you're a certain age anyway you know so why not why not make it a little bit more intimate. informal and intimate yeah, yeah. I, I agree I, Emmett would be a self-confessed curmudgeon but not to mention like aren't most I don't want to say most I'm going to make a big jump on it but a lot of Brazilian footballers their nicknames effectively what they're working off like Pele is not his real name yeah. uh, Ronaldinho I don't think that's like it's not the real it's an, a, maybe abbreviation or something else but it's yeah. certainly a, an effect yeah. in Chicharito Pato. from Mexico with Javier Hernandez like and the great John Giles use that. John Giles would only ever call him Chicharito the little P <laughs> the little P <laughs> 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 do you know yeah. what I'm not mad about but it's only a style thing and it's uh, you know every, each to their own I'm not mad about the way Marty uses nicknames in which case he always says the full name so Bubbles was never Bubbles and he was never John O'Dwyer he was always John, John Bubbles, Bubbles O'Dwyer yeah. <laughs> yeah. at all times like in the middle like, he might have just had a, like, a quick hand pass and a free flowing move and he still found the time to say John Bubbles O'Dwyer yes Will what does the use of nicknames do to you? I'm fine with it I think it's uh, it seems to be very regional the border region and for some reason Leash and Carlo particularly every Leash and Carlo player seems to have a nickname okay. and I was kind of like trying to find out why they got the nickname in the first place particularly when they're unusual like Picky Mar who would be Stephen Picky Mar if you're to give him his full title in Marty format uh, basically his uncle saw him picking stuff out of a bin when he was a kid and it stuck from when he was about two years of age so it's one of those more bonker ones here's one like say Nudie Hughes is another one which I always kind of was wondering about where that came I from I wonder about that one too yeah Samba McNaughton like some of these guys they are kind of as associated with their nickname as their full name yeah well Sambo's th- a great one yeah yeah is it not troubling was there not some troubling part of that oh I don't know I thought there was maybe I'm wrong on that don't know I don't know okay well, I don't mind them. I think like this is surely a fairly small scale thing to be pissed off about. Ah, yeah, but like that's the point of the slot. <laughs> well, it is, I suppose. Yeah, but um, on it's not a new thing, is it? Like the Gooch was definitely called the Gooch. That's that's at least twenty years. Were they doing it in the seventies? 
don't know. I, bomber. It's definitely going back a lot. Bomber. bomber. Let's see, I, yeah. But hold on. Was me hollow hair saying bomber? He probably was actually. He was probably calling. I'd say he'd call him the bomber every now and then. Yeah, but yeah, most yeah. of the time, called him on list. Uh, sorry, Emmett. We're zero for four here. Nobody is too yeah. perturbed. And maybe it does add the a. The Dubs team of the seventies had nicknames as well, didn't they? Like the Blue Panther and nicknames like that. Was I don't know. I don't call anybody. Panther, was he? No, it was all right, Blue Panther. Was <laughs> the <laughs> no, it's like that's not a real nickname. <laughs> <laughs> it's not very catchy. No, but <laughs> you know what I mean, though. They obviously happened ex- in existence for a long time. This is not a new thing that happened just two yes, years yes, ago. Yes. Okay, that was Anthony O'Toole, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I always enjoyed players growing up as well who tried to give themselves a nickname as well and very rarely stuck. Such as? Had to be picked by someone else. Anyone famous? Um, there's a few. Like, I mean, Brian Whitlow's thing is, is Sid or Sydney, oh, yeah, for yeah, example. Calls these him type Sid, of guys. Yeah. And like, everyone calls him Sid. Even his pub is called Sid's. It's not even called Brian Whelan's. It has wasn't saying. Well, um, Paul Innes was a self appointed the governor. 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you know what's wrong? terrible? <laughs> Bloody has stuck as well. Yeah. You know, it's worked. Well, his car plates, as I recall, had the governor written on them as well. That's the extent he went to. Is it a thing in rugby? I feel like the late great. Anthony Foley I feel like Axel was really a kind of in the mm. vernacular every time you know I don't I can't remember the commentary perfectly so I don't know is there any rugby player now that you'd call by his like you would never hear a Zeebs no I don't think no, so no it's all like Woody and Drico and like you know isn't it it's just yeah. uh, like no one's called Soupy in rugby don't think what about the so. honey badger oh yeah Who's one that really stands out? Well, we had indeed. We've had the honey badger, the beast. There's been a few of them over the years. Beast. Yeah, the yeah, bull. Yeah. Honey badger. The bull. The bull. Is, ah, yeah. Ah, the yeah. bull. That's the one. Yeah. yeah, you're dead right. I feel like it's more of a country thing. <laughs> the honey badger. <laughs> <laughs> we move on. I think he was somewhat self appointed as the honey badger originally oh, as well. But. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Right. Um. <laughs> the worst nicknames by the way were where they don't do nicknames at all was like the whole Manchester United team of like the treble thing it was like yeah. Keeney and <laughs> Butty Butty Skulls Skulls Bets that's the Irish Bex. English divide isn't it Beverly we were all O up they, they were just Gary we are all O and they're all E yeah <laughs> hi lads long time first time I had nothing more to say about that uh, given that as a country we have people competing at a high level in most non-team based sports e.g. track and field boxing swimming swimming do we golf cycling motorsports ok in the main I'll concede with his uh, examples how come we have zero tennis players on the world stage please don't blame the weather it rains in other countries keep up the good work Dermot in Dublin not just we've never had uh, like uh, not that we don't just currently have one I, I, it's no. fair to say with the greatest respect to some of our, our better tennis players yeah. who, you know on a global scale did very good things we've never had anyone close to top 40 30 there, no, no you got to go back to like historically over 100 years yeah. about 5 US Open Why, so. So, like, I feel most towns you see a tennis court yeah it's actually an interesting point it's incredibly expensive to try and get into tour that's the main problem I remember talking to Simon Carr about this a while back so he played in oh, son, a couple son of, the, of son of Tommy, Tommy yeah, yeah. Um, has played in a few of the junior majors over the years and his aim is to try and get into the top 100 in the world and get to that point where it makes sense to try and get onto the ATP tour and get to the bigger events so he plays a lot in the Challenger tour big problem he's had a lot of his training because there's so much clay court on the Challenger tour he used to train a lot in Tunisia and in Spain and places like that and yeah. sometimes I'm sure it's the same for golfers who are trying to get on to say from the Challenge Tour the old Challenge Tour on to say the European Tour where it doesn't make financial sense sometimes to some of these tournaments that you go to play at you could go and end up your out of pocket costs could be bigger than the check that you take home afterwards so it's very very difficult and incredibly competitive to try and get on to the main tennis tour I'd say that's a huge huge part of it mm. It's not one of those sports where, as well indigenously here in Ireland like there are a lot of tournaments you could play and you know make a crust without playing abroad Yeah Per capita as well, like the number in Britain isn't that high. I appreciate they've had some far bigger high profile winners and stuff, but yeah. relatively speaking, numbers wise, like it's not like they're packed full of it the way the US is, so uh, it's not even comparable. There's a lot of money gone into tennis in the UK over the last twenty years or so, anyway, maybe thirty years even. Uh I think there's also a cultural aspect to it, isn't there? Like, I mean, we don't have any history of success and I feel like that would breed it, mm. you know, and it's like you don't grow up thinking you're going to be an Irish professional tennis player you know I, I wonder does that come into it much I don't know like obviously there's like 
financial reasons and facility reasons that are probably the biggest thing of all. Like, you know, it's like we just don't have the facilities for somebody to rise. But you would think someone would like kind you of don't. overcome that. Like if if Djokovic genuinely did learn to play tennis in an empty swimming pool. Yeah. You know, like I mean it, it can't you can't be completely limited by a lack no. of facilities. We have tennis courts. I, I we have loads of tennis courts. Mm-hmm. Like and accessible enough once as well to be honest and uh, you're not talking about oh we, we, we need to be in a position to take somebody from the age of 5 to the age of 20 and nurse them at every stage like Andy Murray in fairness went over to near Barcelona I think yeah. so you're just talking like we just need a prodigy who's 12 and then mm. greater forces will take over it's a pity we've not, can you imagine the excitement of Wimbledon yeah you know? Certainly much bigger. Yeah. We've had flirts at time to times. Like I mean Conan Island being the obvious example sure. that stand out that's played at the very, very top level, but never quite. Does maybe. tennis seem to you though when you do like as I said, there's courts everywhere, there's courts really close to me, like really beautiful kind of like five court setup that you walk by in the park. And it seems like such a social game. Like it seems it's like it's an, awful, lo- it's an awful lot of people like in, in their 40s and 50s mm. keeping active. Brilliant. Like amazing that that exists and is there and is, is a great activity. But I rarely see anybody like, you know, remember even like playing snooker one time and like Fergal O'Brien was at the next table and he was like, like hit the same shot for the time it took me and my dad to play like 10 frames. You know, he was just practicing. Mm. I don't think I've ever seen anybody in a tennis court that I would say is like... Dedicated. Is is practicing yeah. because they play at a much higher level and they're just out there. Now, that's not to say they don't exist. I'm just saying that, you know, anecdotally, I see people playing for fun and to keep fit and social. Yeah. Mm. I suppose, uh, E. Miller, we don't obviously have a great answer. We don't know. Maybe the rain doesn't help, even though you said we're not allowed to mention the rain, but maybe it doesn't help. I don't know. We're starting to build some dome courts now at this stage as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. Which yeah. will probably help from that point of view too. Yeah. Let's take a short break. There's a couple of more emails I want to get to, and then uh, Mick McCarthy uh, wants to talk to us about uh, the madness of being a fan, I think, is a uh, general topic. You, you made a face there as if to say, no, I don't. No, no, I do. I do. Okay. I want to stay tuned. Depression <laughs> <laughs> and madness. That's the next topic. All right. Okay. Perfectly sold. We're back in just a minute. A slight tangent is uh, on the way. Oh, I don't know what we do. Just talk, really, for an hour. People love it, Joe. Um, Reform conversation, Joe. Can I... Uh, a, a hat tip to the emailer, by the way, who just wondered, is there a best day for me to send my email on to have a better chance of getting seen? Tuesday. <laughs> Tuesday, five o'clock. I wouldn't worry well, about can it. I, can I tell you the truth? I read them back to front, so the oldest first and generally on a Tuesday morning. So would you prefer me to see it early in the emails or late in the emails? Oof. It's hard to know. What if the first five emails are great? Exactly. I think early. They'll definitely, I'll more likely to forward them to you guys early, but then again, you'll probably read them in the opposite way. So ultimately, Joe will decide what gets read out, just so everybody knows, just well, in case I get the blame for it. I have no system, so uh, I don't know. Email whenever you want. And <laughs> They'll all get read, th- believe it or not. They do. God help us. Yeah. Now, you don't want to hear the things we say about them off air, but <laughs> they get read. Uh, We've got like the about most 50 this week, by the way. Like, I mean, 50 emails into a set. Like, it's incredible. I know. No, on a sincere note, it is amazingly appreciated. Appreciate it. It's, it's so cool to have all these um, people reaching out. The most common question we get asked, it probably applies to our tennis point, is, lads, have you ever thought if all the GEA players would be great at other sports and therefore GEA is stemming us from achieving on the international level? That, I would say, is the most common question. I'd say we've got it six or seven times. We've yeah. never actually addressed it. I don't know what the answer is. I really need to think it's about it. Yeah. I, it's a weird hypothetical because GA does exist. I'm glad it exists. I don't feel like our stymied performance in the international stage is something that I'm willing to give GA up for, even if it was the case. So, Would you give up Claire for like a Wimbledon champion? No. Jamesy O'Connor at Wimbledon? <laughs> no. <laughs> Be all over it. <laughs> no, not now, but in the 90s. Imagine Jamesy was taking on Pete Sambras for, you know, Jamesy to win his fourth Wimbledon in a row. All <laughs> right, there. Did you give up Claire for that? Can we get the Photoshop people on that? <laughs> That'd be unbelievable. <laughs> Tommy Welch versus Jamesy yeah, Tony in, in Wimbledon centre court. Tony oh, Kelly. Two Irish people are in the final. Well, like, it's yeah, like, yeah, players, I mean, that, yeah. Hand-to-eye yeah. coordination and hurling. I mean, are you yeah. telling me Tommy Welch wouldn't be a good hurler? Or sorry, he's a bloody yeah, good right, yeah. tennis player. That's the Phil Mickelson story. Sorry, I was telling you, I was listening to the Phil Mickelson the book, book yeah. about uh, he thought that he just automatically be a great baseball player. So they brought him out and he wasn't able to hit a home run. That's true. That's and funny. stuck at it for hours. Have Hand-eye he... coordination didn't do him much good. Yeah, that's true. My first thought on this, Joe, would be the vast majority of young athletes who are good enough to play professional sport 
will get scouted and picked up anyway. I'm not sure that there's those who are playing GEA and wouldn't at some point have played other sports and been identified, especially when so many people go into, you know, development squads and so on at a reasonably young age, that if you were genuinely a really good rugby player, but you were growing up in a, I don't know, Gaelic football club, that you wouldn't actually make it as a rugby player if you had the talent and drive to do so. Sure, Ireland's best player at the under-20s uh, would be playing for tip. Yeah. And he's gone. And Cork, Cork, uh, the best player in the Cork under-20 team that won the All-Ireland this year, Munster was his last game Connor. for Cork because he's going, into, he's going to play for Munster. So, you know, like, this happens play, most people play more sports than one and they will if they have a chance to play professional they will ultimately choose it because it's their life you so, know what I mean so it's all very well having the love of the game but yeah. so we're saying probably not to the question well, I, don't, I don't think it stops people going playing professional like I think of Fiona O'Hara recently as well where he's gone out to play in the AFL but he had an academy contract from Ulster or he could have played inter-county with Westmead and he decided to go out and play AFL because it was a chance for a professional lifestyle Yeah, I, I don't think the love of GA or the idea Stop. of GA is stilting anyone from not playing elite sport Yeah, David Clifford was on last year I was chatting to him and uh, he was by very much his own admission so you'd look at Clifford and say my god this guy could do anything it's a pity he's playing GA imagine what he could do on the international stage by his own admission he was saying he was a fairly average centre half mm. in soccer which is kind of a wild thought uh, gents love the slot I listen to OTB whenever I'm in the car but it's the only slot I listen back to I never miss an episode keep it up thanks very much I have some tangents you might discuss would love to hear your takes uh, one do you think managers coaches are considerably more important in certain sports I think with the amount of set plays offense versus defense injuries etc NFL coaches or closer to home rugby coaches are way more important than your Premier League manager full disclosure I've never played soccer with a team so this could be an ignorant view <laughs> um, he asked a second uh, question I'll come to that in a moment uh, he finishes by saying I hope this email gets through the selection process PS tell Arthur I am one of his thesis downloaders Kind regards, Richard, in Limerick. Wow. One of 400. One of 400 plus. Yeah. He didn't have time to get back to you individually at this stage, Richard. <laughs> this isn't <laughs> a, a broad thank you to all his downloaders. Um, do I think... Oh, they're definitely... They've got to be more important in certain sports, yeah. I sort of... I, I, I tend to agree with Richard's thread that the more stop-start a sport is, the more important the coach <coughs> is. They can, have, they can exert more control. Yeah. And whilst it's very evident that Pep Guardiola is controlling a lot in the soccer field, at a certain point when play develops, I would think the longer a passage of play goes on, the less predictable it is, therefore the less a coach can impact on it, and so therefore has less of an influence. Does that invert make sure, not argue the fact to the latter, or argue it the other way around? That with less time to do something the coach actually becomes more important in what they can do in that time whereas I think with rugby there's a certain degree with all those gaps where you can probably react you, your reactions don't have to be as quick like whereas Pep Guardiola for instance we take that might have the duration of a throw in to spot something where the play has stopped and someone's somewhere out of place and has to call that there and then if you know what I mean yeah I, I, yeah, but how much does a message actually get across yeah, from I, a coach I, I, I'm almost thinking about it in terms of like the sense is Joe Schmidt basically choreographed these like power plays, which would be four, five, six phases, and uh, and then it's a start, you know, and then maybe there's a scrum or there's a breakthrough, and then Joe Schmidt exerts more. Well, this is what we do from the line out then, and then this is what we do from that scrum. And whereas I sort of feel the more free flowing games, at a certain point, you just don't know what Messi's going to do. He might beat a man, he might not. So I can't tell you where to be. You got to react. That that'd be my guesstimate at the outset. Obviously, I, I, I don't know for sure. The NFL example is interesting. So what a coach actually can do in-game in the NFL, first of all, they're all drilled to an inch of their life, so much so that, like, you know, these are the plays, they have numbers, yeah. you call them, and this is exactly what every single one of the 11 players do on that play, where they stand to start, where they end up, etc. You're basically playing blind. You've, you have to memorise everything. That's why like Bill Belichick's whole thing is like, do your job. Yeah. That's like the mantra is because you actually have a job. Everybody has this specific thing to do on every play. They have 40 seconds per play. For the first 15 seconds of that, the coach can talk to the quarterback. 
so he's calling the plays a lot of the time now the quarterbacks do make decisions as well and, t- and tell the players but the coach has 15 seconds on every play to call a play themselves to talk to the quarterback and even I think th- normally what happens I think is the first 10 plays of every game is predetermined mm. so they go out with a here's what you're going to do for the first 10 yeah. plays that we played so it's so like they're if, so if you have a genius regimented coach, exactly. a genius coach there does a lot what do you, what do you, you think about hurling by the way I oh, see I was thinking about the reverse of this so again in NFL you'd have an offensive coordinator defensive coordinator special teams you have a coaching team oh, coaches. and I think we've moved more towards specialisation in recent years anyway where like you were talking about the rugby example how many times did we say oh Paul O'Connell has done work X on the line out or oh, the sure. scrum I, or let, this is Simon Easterby yeah, yeah, or even let, Andy Farrell's let, fingerprints are over the yeah, fence no, I, I, so that's, that's so true let's call that coaching generally well, as opposed to one coach okay so the hurling one I was thinking about again backroom teams have got bigger by necessity yeah. in recent years I think of Garrod Hegarty going over to get instruction at the weekend from Canary as opposed to going to Kylie where obviously Kylie and Kinnerk work together but Kinnerk must have a huge hands-on role with what they're doing coaching on the pitch to the point that a few years ago when COVID was in they were saying oh look here's Kinnerk and his whiteboard and this is the reason that Limerick are so successful and I would say that's true of a lot of teams that they probably have coaching input from more than just a single coach compared to say like Phil Jackson with the Bulls yeah, or yeah, with I, LA where he'd I, be one guy with the board making all the calls I, I think to be fair whether it's one coach or the coaching team mm. let's just call that the coaching ticket yeah. so it's can a coaching ticket have more or less effect in certain games like I sort of feel hurling there's a degree of right lads uh, there's, see this is there's so madness out there you have people getting instructions onto the pitch true. all the time it is true oh but it like I mean Lim- Limerick and Kilkenny I don't both think I, I think if you're watching those games you don't have to be an expert to see that there was coaching decisions made in both of those games that were huge and instrumental I think definitely won Limerick the game or at least put the game in their favour for the players to go on and execute it and I thought that in you know, in both ways in the Kilkenny Clare game, I think you could see it quite obviously. Kilkenny played the game on the the two most important man markers. You know, TJ Reid basically played in defence for a lot of the first half to bring Connor Cleary out and create holes. Uh, Mikey Butler played basically right half forward for most of the <laughs> at the end of the first half. So Tony Kelly was a complete non factor in defence, and that was all on their terms. But what I was going to say was, Joe, you're saying that like in the more free-flowing games they have less impact in some ways the reason I was mentioning the NFL example is because that's so regimented and so coaching heavy that it's all, it's expected to be like that so their impact is up against the impact of the of the opposition coach and it kind of can be negated somewhat whereas in the more free-flowing games where coaching isn't seen as important like hurling for example that especially when there is that kind of wildness to it and people yeah. sort of say a good coaching decision it might only impact one part of the game but it might not be countered yeah fair enough and okay. could actually have a, as big an impact of anything so, and, and the more we see in football the more it's becoming yeah, clear okay. and obvious that you can't win anything unless you've got a top top coach who you know in a way that I don't think was the case 20 years ago yeah. I don't I think you needed well, a Pep Guardiola to win the Premier League 20 years ago no offence to Alex Ferguson whether a Mayorishka role is going to change slightly with Pat Gilroy coming in to do it this year yeah like how many teams are going to stack it with an extra coach who has the ability to go on pitch and make yeah, instructions yeah, yeah. well let's um let's say then coaching important it's uh, hard for us to some are obviously more important than others I think if there are multiple stoppages you definitely get more interactions yeah what by the way is the sense on the Nicky Quaid a contact lens is that what the issue was on 25 minutes because Davey Fitzgerald I was, I was at the game so I was listening to the radio commentary and his sense in commentary was I'm not sure now there's too much wrong with Nicky and obviously momentum is against uh, <laughs> Limerick at the moment John Kiley has called this utterly laughable they like sent that, that, that he stopped the game that Nicky Quaid kind of said mm, it's laughable to suggest and, that's not the case and, and take the sting out of things now would, that Nicky Quaid Nicky Quaid knew exactly what he was doing he stopped the game for around about I think it was 53 seconds it was clicked up that the stoppage happened it could genuinely have fallen out it seems a bit of a coincidence that was that time when Limerick could have done with a bit of a reset at the time but for anyone who has looked at the course of events that happened afterwards actually Galway were reasonably on top just after it happened so it was two points to one to Limerick against Galway for the six minutes the following Galway had two goal chances so yeah. I don't buy the idea that actually something flicked like a flick of a switch moment where Limerick readjusted and next thing the game went entirely in their favour that wasn't the case but it definitely 
helped. And like, if you have your goalkeeper, whether it's a contact lens, whether it's not being able to get the ball out as quickly for a puck out, you would be silly not to take the opportunity to slow things down if you're under the cosh. Here's what Kylie said as a matter of interest. I think it's absolutely ridiculous we're talking about this two days after the uh, game. It's utterly laughable, to be honest. It's unbelievable. Of course, it's a focus that's been driven by a few individuals, but I find it absolutely crazy. I'm not privy to Nikki's medical history. Can you imagine me going to Nikki? What's your sight like, Nikki? Would you seriously think I'd be doing such a thing like that? Absolutely not. And then he said it was James Owens who called for the doctor to come on, not... Nicky Quaid he said number one I'll highlight who called in the doctor James Owens did the referee so go and ask James Owens why did James do that because his umpire expressed concern to James about Nicky because Nicky wasn't feeling well that's what happened fact obviously these people are commenting online they don't know the facts and I think they're very important your goalkeeper is probably oh, the was, ideal person what, for it to what did the doctor do don't know. Was it a, was it a, a lens? No, I'm just saying well, I saw other physios say that sometimes they carry spare contact lenses for players because it can happen during a game. Oh, yeah. You should so, see it in loads of sports. Yeah, and it I think happen. it's more likely to be stopped if a goalkeeper at a restart goes, oh, my contact lens has fallen out and I'm down, goes to the referee, I need to get a contact lens. He allows the physio to come on. If you're an outfielder and you were trying to stop the game in the same circumstance, you may well even have to go for HIA because it would be a head injury that the referee would be stopping the game for. I just wonder if Limerick wanted to do it again, if this is a deliberate tactic does Nicky Quaid risk doing it in the All-Ireland final where the referee might say just get on with it because it's draw, obviously the incident's drawn a lot of attention now mm. not an incident yeah there isn't I'm a sport in the world thanks. where people don't go down and by the way look if John Kiley's right fine I don't really care but like there isn't a sport in the world where someone doesn't try and take the momentum out of something like that mm. You know, I just I was talking last week about the difference in sportsmanship, and you know, and, and I was probably on the side of like let there be some kind of unwritten rules and all that. But I think in this one, it's like it's just a natural thing, isn't it? It's like you need to slow the game down. Your team needs to get a bit of a grip. Like it's all part of the game, isn't it? Even if say in theory that this is what happened here, you know. Mm. By the way, I don't think for a moment this is a pre-planned move. I just wonder what happens if Nicky goes down in the final. Will a referee be aware of what's happened here and all the talk around it and maybe time to hurry it on? Mm. I don't think so. I think the same thing. I'm fairly certain the same thing happened at the Tipperary game. So it's definitely one of the games I was at Limerick Tipperary to Quaid yeah I yeah, think so da- definitely Davey on commentary uh, again I started laughing as I was listening he said, I'm not sure it's the first time it's happened to Nicky I don't think so I'm pretty certain a game I was at because I remember there being some apprehension I don't know was I further away from it or something you're like I hope he's not actually injured yeah um, and did it not did, am I man thinking it happened in the Munster final Am I completely? I, I might have, but again, it's like it's I one of those things. Oh, that. It's so I don't remember. I didn't didn't annoy me if it did happen. Paul yeah, like, Murphy also, said it happened in the 2019 semi final yeah. between Limerick and Kenny as well. And was he like upset about it? Not really. No, he was like, it's just a clever yeah. move. If it is a case of you can find a way to maybe just slow the tension down yeah. for a few seconds, get the contact lens like, back in. Move it's on. not like yeah. those 53 seconds are open exclusively to Limerick. Mm. You know what I mean? It's not like it's not. Galway could have stemmed you know, the tide. So if, yeah. if Aina Murphy or whatever does it in the fifty-fifth minute, are Galway going to turn around against Limerick? Probably not. Yeah. <laughs> so like, what's the what's the difference? You know what I mean? It's like the time is there for both people. To There's use just it. different ways of doing it. Like I mean, the, if you, I'd like to see the combined time it took for Kilkenny to take about six sideline cuts in the second oh, half. Here we go now. That's, I'm not. I'm saying. <laughs> I'm saying that everybody does you're, it. You're 44 minutes later than we thought. And everybody does it. No, he's and right. He's right. It, There's yeah. different ways to do it and some are more noticeable than others is all I'm saying yeah okay you can take a thing out for free like you decide to change yeah. free taker you flick the ball back it's yeah. everyone does this Mayo, Mayo should have done it against Dublin maybe a few times how are you feeling about uh, your love of player is it more <laughs> how am I feeling about my love of them does it hurt more than it's worth it yeah yeah that, that's kind of well that, that was you know we were talking about before the break I suppose my overwhelming sense um Yesterday, a little bit less so today. Certainly, Sunday night was. Is this worth it? Like, is this? <laughs> is this like? I I am oh a thirty-eight year old man with a wife, two kids, a house, a car, and a job, <laughs> and there is no reason that I should be sick to my stomach over something that happened in sport. So, has it ruined your week so far? Yeah. <laughs> My Monday morning was awful. Monday morning, I was like, I was trying to listen to like podcasts. I was going to li- read a few articles. I couldn't stomach them. I just didn't want. I didn't rewatch the match. I didn't anything. Right. Once I kind of started work, it became a little bit more like normal. 
but I was just like just felt rotten walking up that road walking up like North Circular Road kind of back to Drumcondra and just thinking I just don't want to come to these games anymore I just don't want to put myself through it you know people telling me it was a classic and all of this was like nonsense I don't like it's just a complete irrelevance to me whether it was a good game or what people thought of it or anything like that it was just a and Funny enough, it was the same feeling last year after getting hammered, but it was it didn't last as long. It was different. There was no kind of you were building yourself up to it for the whole game, basically. Whereas you were you were hoping till the end last week, and then you're just then you start thinking about all the little things that happened, the little kind of like a, a, a decision made here or a little free here or something like that, you know. And you start counting up how many scores it is, and bloody hell! And it's just like I am. Um, I just think it, there's something kind of weirdly pathetic about sport mattering to me so much. Yeah. Like I'm just like that's the team that's like where my family is from. It was the team I went to watch games for all when I was growing up. Always had my summers in Clare. That's when you go to GA matches. But I don't know any of these lads. I know one a little bit, um, and I've met a few more or whatever. But like I've been watching them all their lives as well, or all their adult lives as well. Anyway, and you just develop this thing. But what does it matter to me really? You know, it matters to them, and that's who I kind of feel for in a game at like this. But it's like I would just be interested in what other people think because there's sort of no letting it go. Like you know what I mean? It's just this sort of I can't help it. I don't want to necessarily be like it's so silly you say it in isolation it's like oh yeah team lost match yeah. my day is affected my ne- my week is affected Arthur, but it genuinely does would you agree Mick is pathetic <laughs> 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 now we've had this discussion before it's it's um it's mirror image. It's the exact same. I didn't you do you don't feel that way about Limerick early. Oh yes 100%, he does. 100%. What? He's sick for a week before every match and starts it's, justifying, well, if they lose now, at least we had this run and everything like that. I'll tell you how bad it is. It's so bad that it's like, if they go on and win on Sunday week, and I, I used to point this out as well, I don't see myself as some sort of super fan for that. I don't equate it to how much I care. Yeah. It's an in, it's an involuntary thing. It's not something you're, it's, I don't see it as any sort of positive. Um, but the, you know, the, the, the enjoyment from them winning, if they were to win on Sunday week, might last a few days and then it's that sort of gnawing thing that it's going to be coming it's like and now it's going to be everything around this five in a row it's like and that was like what if that doesn't happen and you're like it'll be so disappointing in that regard because it's an added sort of element now to disappointment if they were to lose on Sunday week yeah. you're kind of like it's an unfortunate stumbling block You, but there's it, I'm realistic the last few years have been so good that it outweighs things but then if that is to be won and you're like right well now it is kind of an hour never type moment for that right. and yeah but 100% I don't know why I didn't realise you felt it so deep and it's it's but it's it's the, the I find the worst part about it is that it's the negatives like the, no the positives are fantastic but far more fleeting than the annoy than the sort of anxiety that comes with it pure anxiety mm-hmm. and I remember talking to thing Eamon Cregan who's in a obviously slightly different position than both of us in terms of his relationship to his county but Eamon Cregan with Limerick won't watch them anymore Two and and he's literally he won in All Ireland as a player, won in All Ireland as a manager with Offaly, has seen the against team. You know, you know what I mean against Limerick, which probably didn't do well, but now can't watch them. Too nervous. It's too even now, really like you know, four and five years or whatever it is, and still can't. Because it's just I don't know what it is, Joe. I don't know what it is. It's a very strange phenomenon. It's interesting that Cregan went on to continue coaching so late into his life. Like he was, yeah, yeah. you know, with Mary Eye up until recently enough, until Jamie Wall took over. And yet he won't go to watch Limerick, but he'll happily Won't even coach. watch them on the TV. Yeah. He won't watch the matches. Wow. Yeah. Let's see, uh, in your book, you're saying he turns on the radio for like little blasts. Yeah. To get a little like thing. 10 seconds, then turns it off again. Like washing the car, wasn't yeah, it? Washing, washing the, the car. car. Yeah, yeah. Just does yeah. anything. I know, I get my mum's a bit like that with Mayo. She's going, yeah. Do the. Shouting what's the exact same. My mum's the same. It's not, and it's she wouldn't be as she wouldn't certainly be so dedicated to it that it's all of her life. But there's just something in it that's just, I think it to be honest with you, I think it comes down to what it means to other people who are close to you. I think so. I think that's what it comes down to because I've no, I'm not even, I'm not born in Limerick. I was like, I've been there an awful lot, but I've no affiliation. Uh, to the place like that but I think it's just because well, it's I, important I'd, to someone I, else yeah I'd feel a bit like that with Mayo because my parents as yeah. much as anything but um, I, I think that's what it is if you want to do it Nick's is a purely selfish uh, situation oh, he just wants it yeah. he wants the glory <laughs> selfish about it <laughs> I'm joking I'm no joking. but it's it's actually not like I mean it's sell, it, I, I don't like it no I know you're joking but I think it's worth talking about because it's something to do with me 
that's the other thing. It's like it's it's like what glory do I get from other people winning a game? I have to say that'd be my pretty dominant thought in the main, yeah. Yeah, but there's that's what I'm saying. It's nothing to do with glory. That that doesn't the joy and pain that comes from it isn't anything to do with like these these like I hate when I hate when like Sky Sports say like you know oh Liverpool have the Merseyside bragging rights and I like bragging rights. That's not what that's not what sports fandom is about. It's just, it's about pain. <laughs> It is. It's about pain, and then the the hope that you know one day it won't be pain. <laughs> you know, the flip of it's so exciting. The last few years have been unbelievable. Oh, I'm sure. And it's the little things. It's the little things. Then when the all stars come around, and you're like, geez, nine of them or whatever it was. Like, <laughs> <laughs> we only have thirteen this year. What a team! What a team do we follow? I just, it, it's so. Uh, mm. Do you feel that way about Villa? No, wait to a way lesser extent. In the moment, a little bit, but okay. no, it wouldn't be effective. Although I have been, I have been told by my wife that she does sometimes uh, not enjoy. Uh, you know, if the nine months of the year that Villa are playing, the, the Saturday, the Saturday evening, it'd be like, oh, jeez, and if Villa lose, then you just be in a uh, bad mood all yeah. night. Like, and I was like, I, I, I dispute That's it. Shocking. I dispute that. That is, pathetic. but I've been told it. That is pathetic to use your word. Yeah, okay. You're enjoying this, aren't you? <laughs> it is the bad thing about a Friday night kickoff or a Saturday morning kickoff, though. It can entirely ruin your weekend. Wow. So I left here last Friday. We were playing first round of local championship that evening. Went to the game. We're playing one of our local rivals. And my thought going back home was... Who's we? If, Sorry. Uh, Burr in this case. Oh, yeah. If I got home, I would. Have, I was half thinking, we lose this first round of championship. I'm going to be in foul form all weekend. They won, and it set my weekend be- up beautifully. Hmm. But I would have been angry all weekend if they had played badly and we'd lost. Yeah, but you, you you see where I'm coming from. You haven't yeah, chimed yeah. in really. I think the connection is deeper, obviously, when it's closer to. Uh, uh, how far beyond local then is your love stretching? Who are you? Yeah. Do you support? Do you support a Premier League team? No. Okay. Now, like awfully, obviously, I would feel yeah. strongly about it. But there's plenty of other teams that you would admire, or you know, you'd enjoy watching, or whatever else. In those cases, I think you can flick the TV off and just move on with your life afterwards. But yeah. when it's people you know and you know something that you're attached to I think it's a very different feeling and I know there's some Premier League fans who feel just as strongly about that I'm not um, writing off their experiences at all what but about I think the League of Ireland fans tend to about that what about rugby and football international teams I have very little care really yeah. I find the football team I get very angry about in a way that I don't about the yeah. about the hurling and it's like it's it's just as irrational. <laughs> it's uh, Where it's are a you different with, emotion what about when the Patriots play surely that doesn't ruin you on a Monday not anymore. It's it always been known to. Time, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was a time about the Super Bowl or the play. Yeah, no, I love. I, 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 yeah, people have followed me on Twitter for a long time. will remember a few kind of AFC Championship meltdowns. <laughs> oh. <laughs> How meltdowny were you after Eli Manning yeah, and the unbeaten season going to bat? Oh, but that was no, no, that, that was bad. But I don't really remember. I remember like it, it, that was pre-Twitter. But I remember when they lost to the Ravens one year, and I, I stupidly went out, and the NFC game was on first, so I was uh, well lubricated by the time the Patriots <laughs> game came on, and uh, I kind of lost my mind a little bit. Yeah. We've got to go. We're pretty much out of time. Oh, Arthur, God. am I right in saying that uh, this semi-final weekend in the football is a bit of a downer for you? Yeah, yeah, just because it's it's very rare you'll come into it that you want to see. Let's say objectively, I want to see two teams win, which would be Dublin Kerry, because it'll make final better, better final. But at the same time, what a sad situation it is that That's the most true. common final of all is the one you're hoping for. Well, I get it. Those the two best teams, but why is almost every second phase of this championship just a well? <laughs> Let's grin and bear it. It's going to be better very soon. <laughs> it's very strange. Is what it a ever final the, is it's ever be, the good though. stuff? We were told the knockout phases would just be unbelievable. It's just one of those years now where you could have like Dublin or Kerry winning the football All Ireland. Kilkenny could win the hurling All Ireland, and you're like, oh, what's it all been for? I know all the talking. It's I just... wonder if we've a wonderful final between Dublin and Kerry though where people look back with a certain amount of nostalgia about this year's football but it's a bit like the Dublin Mayo finals I think sometimes gave a nice aftertaste to poor championship seasons so the final will linger yeah. now, if, it's an, if it's not a good final oh, like a imagine. long six months like, yeah. a long yeah. six months in sports I, talk I think radio the, I think these semi-finals could surprise people I think the bigger question is we should want the underdogs to win if you're not from Dublin or Kerry but at the same time I, I think if people are being honest with themselves they <laughs> don't know. want the Derry oh, Monaghan oh, yeah. final do you want you a Derry Monaghan final I'd love no. one of Derry or Monaghan to win the All-Ireland uh, no. but I don't necessarily <laughs> want them no, to no, play no. against each other in the final you want that a Dublin Kerry of, final it could be one of those years where the Hurland final gets more viewers than the football <laughs> <laughs> That's like, is that that funny? there are normally only about 
Uh, they're still a good. Them. No, they're still a good. Isn't there a hundred thousand? Maybe a hundred thousand yeah. or so between them, isn't there? Yeah. I just think yeah. Derry Monaghan. Nobody wants that. Yeah, but I'd like. Well, I would love to see either. <laughs> Even of Derry Monaghan don't want that. <laughs> what? I would love to see either of them win it. I, I just you. don't want them to play each other in the final. <laughs> okay. I won't be against no, Derry Dublin final. So if Monaghan, if Monaghan um, beat Dublin, you'd be very much cheering Kerry on the Sunday. Yeah, I think that's fair to say. Actually, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Just for the good of anything but Monaghan Derry. That's what you're saying to me. Is that what I'm saying? You're forgiving me this fight. That was a very tabloid, tabloid and and very, uh, very tabloid. mischievous move, I, mood, I would say. Yeah. We're, uh, we're pretty much done. Uh, so thank oh you very God. much. Deep emails coming. <laughs> Get back to my depression. <laughs> uh, Will, thank you. Cheers, lads. Uh, Michael, thank you. And Arthur Dean, nice to have you back, Arthur. Thanks, Joe. <laughs>